It's great to see the, uh, hey Charles, don't sit on that. Play good. Um, as, as far as uh, being sanitary, after we got this all arranged yesterday, the school has a uh, walk around sprayer that they spray the entire place. So, except for the uh, Chinese virus friends that you brought in, nothing's been in here. And whoa, <coughs> with everything that's been going on this year, it's hard to uh, think about what our ancestors must have gone through. Uh, 250 years ago, and I think uh, Charles is going to speak later this afternoon about what South Carolina is doing to refresh our memories. But there was something like bloodshed in Boston, and uh, South Carolina was taking a big view of importing goods. Taxes have been raised, sound like anything we know. And a uh, guy by the name of Montague was moving the House of Commons to uh, Buford. So people here weren't real happy either. Uh, one thing that a lot of people always forget is that Charleston, 250 years ago, according to the, the historians, was the wealthiest area in the United States. And I think if you check uh, Walter Edgar's figures on it, Charleston was wealthier than the next five states put the uh, next five wealthy areas, mainly in, from Virginia North, uh, put together. So uh, it was an important area, and we we're going to find out a lot about what the folks here did to make it possible for us to have our uh, independence for this length of time. We appreciate you joining us, and uh, as you can imagine. The Chinese virus caused Carol and I a lot of discussion time as to whether we wanted to do it at all, how we were going to do it, how many people we were going to have. And the first good thing when we got back from California and we checked with the school, we found out that, yeah, it's no problem. Go ahead and have it. It's fine with us. That may have been a little bit of a lead, but it turned out okay, as you can see. Uh, we were at, for anybody that's concerned, are we complying as much as we know what the rules are? We're one fifth of the capacity of this facility, so we're well with any guidelines that we could find. Uh, <clears throat> you probably like the two of us trying to remember our masks especially me, and to remember social distancing. But with the tables off like this enough, hopefully that will uh, lend itself. The emergency exit seats are things you know, we're required to speak about. Emergency exits, obviously, over to the side here, this side, south, east side, goes straight out the same way you came in. For those on this side, if you need to get out in a hurry, go right through those doors. The lights are on and you'll see right opposite that door, there's an exit. And the one, the door that's open up there where it goes through the kitchen, goes right on outside. For those that haven't found them, if you go out these doors, go down to the right, turn right, and the men keep turning right, and the women turn left at the end there. Or you can go across the hall and there are restrooms over there. <clears throat> if you should not be happy with the things that are, are, that are available at our snack bar over there, I invite you to go on down the large hallway, the corridor here, all the way to the end, look into the left, and you'll find a regular vending machine area there. Our sale, for those that have been before, Obviously our sales area is uh, sort of eliminated. Carol did bring some books. If you wanted books last year, 
that we didn't have with us. She's got them this year and she'll dig them out for you. I think everybody's got their name tags on by now. And uh, you should have found in your folder a little cardboard with your name on two sides that you can make fold and put where you're sitting. If you'll do that, you own the spot until we disperse uh, tomorrow afternoon. When you leave tonight, you can leave your stuff here. That's fine. Please put it on the chair by your spot because after we're out of here, Franklin's going to come by with a disinfectant and spray the whole works again. Again, for those that have not been before, if you look in your folder, you'll see there's a bio about each individual presenter. I don't intend to stand up here and read it to you, so you read it when you want to. On the back, for those that forgot to bring a notebook or don't generally bring a notebook, if you want to make notes, there's room on the back of the paper for you to do that. I'm not going to run up here and speak each time there's a presenter. So presenters, I would like you to look and see who's following you and just say, following me will be David and we'll figure it out and we'll go like that. Up here there's also wipes so that when you're finished you can wipe off the microphone and leave it for the next person. There's also uh, the hand sanitizer if you feel a need for that. And if you <coughs> were watching there's this uh, show that we had up here for our murals, showing what all our murals are that we have through the county, also the sponsors. You also saw somebody talking to a group of people, telling them it's huzzah, not hooray. David, do you want to demonstrate that? <laughs> for George and Carol put this on, even in this. Hip hip! Huzzah! Hip hip! Huzzah! Hip hip! Huzzah! Okay, you all really did good. A couple of years ago we tried to do that and David was doing it all by himself. So we're, we're getting that down, David. Thank you. Uh, we're shooting for 20 minute breaks. If it runs late, that, that, if the presentation runs a little bit late, we may have to uh, cut that out. I can, Carol talked to all the presenters about trying to go for uh, 30 minutes and then a, uh, about five minutes of uh, questions and answers. If I stand up presenters over here, that gives you a good idea that we're out of time for your section. If the lights go off or I pull the plug on the mic, you will know that you finally got it. I usually tell some of this stuff during the uh, formal dinner since we aren't having that one. And formal dinners, are, for those that haven't been here, is not very formal. It's just a bigger meal. Uh, everybody that comes to a symposium is automatically put on the, as an associate member to the Swamp Fox Mural Trail Society. So we have a pretty big society. <coughs> And I have to point out, we get a lot of questions about this guy that comes and takes pictures for us every year. And uh, it's Elwood Owens. And I'm always at a loss whether it should be doctor or lawyer or video photographer. Elwood was, some of you may know, was one of the leading heart surgeons in the country and a lot of his innovations are still being used worldwide. He was at McLeod, and I guess he got bored with, you know, just cutting people open and sewing them back up. So he went back and he, he thought the lawyers would probably have a good deal. So he went to law school and he did law. 
And I guess he got bored with that, so now he's coming to take pictures of us. I think that's worth some good size. Uh, we also have some other folks that I want to recognize now uh, that they'll wave their hand. Usually we got that wall across here and you can't see them hiding back there. But we got Doug Butterfield sitting back there with the food and the Gloria Joseph. I think Lewis is outside here, Lewis Griffin. And uh, Sue Erdair. 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 <laughs> she filled in a spur of the moment for Carol to help her with the uh, sign-ins. And uh, Milana Maxi is back there. And uh, she's got, I think you got some face masks for sale. Okay, she did, heads up the local chapter, I think it is, of the Quilts of Honor. Valor. Valor. Quilts of Valor. Quilts of Valor, okay. I thought it was an honor that they gave me a Quilt of Valor. How about it? <laughs> it's a beautiful thing, and it's a beautiful uh, effort that they do, and I'm uh, certainly grateful for them. Any questions? I know you will not hesitate to uh, ask Carol or I. Dinner tonight at 6 o'clock. And uh, our presenter is already in the back there, ready to go. And I think he has a new book this year. Is that right? Yay! And if you haven't got his first two books, you probably need those books in order to know what's going on with this young soldier that he's writing about in his books. It's great Christmases. <laughs> and I think the the guy started out as a private fighting the Indians up in Canada or somewhere. In the snow anyway. And he is now down here as a captain, is that right? Or he's out in the western part of the state as a captain. He's your captain advising Colonel Grant and Bill the President in their campaign against the Anglo Territory. And Francis Marion is a second lieutenant under him. Correct, it's a multi company. See, I don't have to read your book, Gary. <laughs> okay. So we'll have packages in for Christmas. If you, if you should want a, a video of the uh, symposium, if you'll let Kara, uh, Carol know, we'll have those for you eventually. And uh, if, the, if it isn't immediately, it's not because Elwood doesn't get them to us. It's because George doesn't want to spend the time copying them. <clears throat> when you leave, if you leave your little name tag out there, we'll uh, sanitize them and use them again next year. Tomorrow noon, we'll be taking pictures, or Elwood will be taking pictures of the uh, SR, the SAR, the DAR, and uh, we'll have those available at some point too. Uh, at this point, are there any veterans of the Vietnam era who have here who have not received a DAR Vietnam honor pin? I guess you'd call it recognition pin. Every you did not have one. Looks like just one. Okay. Okay. So you'll get that tomorrow noon. Does anybody have any questions for me at this time? Is there wireless access in here? Yes. Yes. How? Uh, you ought to be able to see it as <clears throat> FV DuBose with an M after it you search for wireless and then the code it, it just let me on but I if you have to have a code it's a capital R U online question mark capital R U online question mark see if that will get you on you're gonna have trouble thank you 
too. Mm -hmm. Okay, Durant, first slide is up here. And in case she forgets, Mark, hold up your hand, Mark. Is going to follow him, and uh, he'll be talking about how the uh, folks in Southern Illinois won the American Revolution. <laughs> Thank you, Durant. Thanks, George. Looks like we got the clicker working now. Well, uh, I'd like to tell everybody that uh, I'm honored to be here. I appreciate the invitation from Carol. I regard myself as a lay historian. I'm just a regular guy who's interested in history. I'm a backcountry or upstate historian. I sort of emphasize um, the historic sites within a short distance of where I live. I live in southern Greenville County, and what I have found out is the backcountry, the upstate of South Carolina, has just a bevy of Revolutionary War sites. And many of these sites are overlooked and unpreserved. And I sort of specialize in preserving these sites based on my lifetime experiences. I'm a, uh, for the past 40 years, been a landscape contractor and designer. I do have a master's degree in landscape architecture from Georgia with a graduate minor in preservation. But I am a frustrated preservationist, particularly since I live in Greenville. Greenville is progressive, which means that if there's anything historic standing in the way of progress, it gets torn down. But there are a few places that the folks in the upstate don't know about, which we have found out is pretty good places for Revolutionary War activity. But before I get started about the Revolutionary War activity, and we are here at the Francis Marion Symposium, and you are my captive audience. You get to hear about my namesake. This is Henry Durant, who is one of Marion's men. And all my life, I've heard about Henry Durant. I'm named after him. And what I've heard about is Major Henry Durant. So here is a historical marker dedicated to Henry Durant. Now, for the past 20 years, this marker has disappeared. Nobody knows where it is. But we know it existed because I found this on the internet. So that means it's valid. What you can't see is at the bottom here, right down here, it says that this marker was erected by the Major Henry Durant chapter of the DAR. So all my life, I spent my time looking for Major Henry Durant. Who is this guy? And I couldn't find him. I couldn't find anything about him. There's no references to Major Henry Durant. But the DAR put up that marker. It's got to be valid. So after a while, I started looking at everybody who was associated with Francis Mary. Surely, 
the name Henry Durant will show up. And a few years ago, lo and behold, I found it. I found a listing of Marion's men, and there were three words beside the name Henry Durant. The first word was scout. And I thought, how neat is that? I'm descended from a scout of Henry of uh, Francis Marion. Then I looked at the second word. It said, spy. It's getting better now. I love that. A spy for Francis Marion. Then the third word, private. <laughs> so I'm descended from Private Henry Durant, who is a scout and a spy for Francis Marion. And I'm kind of proud of that, as you can tell. But we have few records of Henry Durant. We know from his indent, his bill for services rendered, that he presented in 1785, that he served for 183 days over a two and a half year period. We don't know which 183 days. We don't know what he did, what he was involved with. We do know he was a spy though. But um, there's two dates in the record that we are aware of his activities. And one of those dates was May the 10th, 1780, when he signed a letter with several of his compatriots to uh, General Benjamin Lincoln in Charleston saying that, hey man, we got to surrender to the British because we're surrounded, we're being bombarded with red hot cannonballs, and uh, it's time to give up the ghost here. So uh, two days later, you know what happened, May the 12th, 1780, Charleston capitulated. So that's one date that we know where Henry Durant was involved. The other incident that we know about Henry Durant being involved in happened in July of 1780. And we know about this because 67 years after this event, Dr. Robert Witherspoon recorded the earliest experience that he could remember in his life. As a six-year-old six boy, Dr. Witherspoon was on the front porch of his father's plantation. And they were just sitting there on a hot summer day when all of a sudden they noticed a lone horseman galloping at full speed around the bend, going as fast as he possibly could. And that got their attention. And then what really got their attention was they found 20 dragoons of Bannister Carlton's men right on the heels of that lone horseman going full speed. So what had happened is after the fall of Charleston, Henry Durant hooked up with uh, Major John James of the King Street Regiment who was in opposition to the British um, control in the Low Country. And Major, uh, Henry Durant was serving as a spy. His duty was to observe the King Street Lower Bridge to report to Colonel James if um, Tarleton was coming that way. Well, by the time uh, Private Durant got to the King Street Lower Bridge, Tarleton had already crossed, and he was in trouble. And that's when he uh, raced backwards, being chased by 20 of Tarleton's dragoons. He jumped off his horse at full speed, and with the speed of a hunted stag, he ran through the cornfield on the opposite side of the road, a cornfield covered in pea vines. And as he jumped off and ran, Carlton's goons were just right after him. And a few minutes after that, Tarleton himself came to the front yard of the Witherspoon Plantation, pulled out his sword, waved his sword over uh, Dr. Witherspoon's father. Where is that spy? 
Where is that spy? If I find him here on your property, I will hew you down. Well, Private Durant was never found, and I'm here to be evidence of that to this day. So that's my story of Marion's man, one of Marion's men, typical of the time. And since we're here at the Francis Marion Symposium, I thought maybe y'all would enjoy that little story. But that's my name, sir. But back to why we're here, uh, battlefield preservation in the upstate. This is, this is Lawrence County, South Carolina. I live right here in Greenville County, on the banks of the Reedy River. Now, I know most of you, if not all of you here, are very familiar with Jack Parker's book on uh, battlefields um, in the state of South Carolina. If you'll look here for Lawrence County, 17 listings. I do lectures at the local museums in the upstate, and one of the lectures that I was preparing, I was going to title it, 50 battles within 50 miles in this area i was going to enumerate 50 revolutionary war events that happened with within 50 miles of that spot but i quickly realized there was no way i could title that lecture that way once i started adding up the different sites from parker's book within 50 miles of this area right here, there's 112 different Revolutionary War events. 112 within 50 miles. No place in America can make that statement. More so within 50 miles of Lawrence Greenville County than anywhere in America. The second most place with 85 events, according to Parker's book, is Monk's Corner, South Carolina. So you know that we're right in the heart of Revolutionary War activity. And I just sort of fell into battlefield preservation. I fell into it when I was working at the Hopkins Plantation in Southern Greenville County. This is an historic 500 acre farm and I was working there for a couple of years doing landscaping when John Hopkins said to me have I ever shown you Patriots Grove and I said what is Patriots Grove Patriots Grove is an alley an alley of pecan trees planted by John Hopkins family in 1876. These pecan trees you see right here are 145 years old. This is the site of the Battle of the Great Cane Break, the only Revolutionary War or the only pitched battle that ever occurred in Greenville County. This is the site where uh, Captain Patrick Cunningham had captured um, shot and powder intended for the Cherokee Indians. Uh, he, the first siege of 96 uh, evolved as a result of that. Cunningham escaped from that um, uh, altercation and he went to the wildest place that he possibly could. And that place was the bottomland in a cane break in Southern Greenville County on the Reedy River. At the time that Patrick Cunningham was ensconced here, this was all covered in thick river cane, 10 feet tall, that you could barely get through. River cane was always a site where the Native Americans, Cherokees in particular, went for defense. You could not sneak up on anybody in a cane break. The rustling leaves made entirely too much noise. It was a defensive stance. 
And this is where that battle take, took place. Now, I'm going to mention several names concerned with this battle, and we're going to be talking about this throughout the rest of my discussion. I talked about Captain Patrick Cunningham, who was the um, loyalist leader. He was there with James Lindley. 19-year-old Sergeant David Fanning was there. The um, Patriot commander was William Danger Thompson, very famous uh, South Carolina uh, Patriot. Another Cunningham that was there, in addition to Captain Patrick Cunningham, was his first cousin, Bloody Bill Cunningham. Bloody Bill Cunningham fought at the Battle of the Cane Break as a patriot. So, what do we do to preserve this site? And the Hopkins family has done a wonderful job of preserving this site over the past 145 years. This is a difficult site to get to. Uh, Patrick Cunningham wanted the most difficult site that he could imagine to hide out from uh, Major Thompson. And it's bottom land, it floods. In, um, in February of this year, this entire site was eight feet underwater. So it's not very easily accessible. And we, we do take groups down to this area. There's sometimes we just can't get down to it, period. Other times we use four-wheel drive vehicles to get the folks there. But preservation, preservation of this site. And the preservation, the type of work that I do is not rocket science. What I do in so many times is try to restore the sites as they were during the Revolutionary War, but that's a very difficult thing to do in a lot of cases. But the real goal is to get these sites at the point for interpretation. Get these sites at a place where these stories can be told. And as part of the series we were doing, you know, in-house lectures and so forth, um, I would be giving lectures on Tuesdays and Wednesday nights and that sort of thing. And then we would actually go to these sites on the following Saturdays. And we would do a lot of field trips. And I know a lot of folks in here have been on these field trips. And that's something we enjoy quite a bit. But, you know, we're not going to restore this to 10 foot tall river cane, especially since all these fine, um, pecans are here. There were at least 34 planted. There are 17 of the pecans standing now. So here you can see the pecans in the background. Here you can see a pecan that we planted. Um, I planted another double row of pecans on the outside of the original alley. So hopefully in 145 years, these pecans will be as grand as those. And you can see the pecan right there that's illustrated by Lomax's shirt. Um, these pecans are already bearing nuts. So um, I never would have dreamed that pecans would grow in a wet situation like this. I didn't know that, but I learned it now. Pecans like wet feet. So here's another site that I started working on. Uh, this is Fort Thickety, but it's not Fort Thickety. Um, the Fort Thickety battlefield, this is in Cherokee County. It was important because this is where Isaac Shelby made his first appearance in uh, South Carolina. He was in South Carolina in the summer of uh, 1780. Uh, um, and he fought in several engagements here. One is Fort Thickety, uh, Battle of the Peach Orchard in, in uh, Spartanburg County. That was a war of a skirmish. And as a result of this excursion, 
Uh, he found out that there was a um, loyalist outpost, communications post at Musgrove Mill containing 200 people. So um, uh, Isaac Shelby and James Williams from uh, Little River District or Lawrence County and Elijah Clark from uh, Georgia gathered up a force of 200 men and whipped the 600 loyalists who had been reinforced overnight unknowingly they whipped that force and Musgrove Mill was a real turning point for the American fortunes because this happened right after the Battle of Camden and right after the Battle of Fish Dam Ford where uh, Sumter uh, lost so, so badly. Musgrove Mill was a glimmer of hope from Isaac Shelby's visit. This is the first place that Isaac Shelby came to, was Fort Thickety. Now, Fort Thickety sat on a nice hill and it's got a wonderful well there, which is a wonderful place to put a farmhouse. So, at a certain point after the battle, a few decades, a, a farmhouse was built on top of Fort Thickety right smack dab on top of it. And three generations of farmers lived there. And on this property, there was a structure, a log structure, that had rotted down to just these bottom layers. But for over a hundred years, the surrounding community considered this to be for thicket. And the Cherokee County or Cherokee Historic and Preservation Society raised $20,000 to add other logs from uh, surrounding structures and this roof here. And they did a great job with that. And they're doing a good job with Fort Thickety. But that's not the fort. Uh, this big, I don't have any before pictures of, of Fort Thickety. There is an area a couple hundred feet away from that structure that has what could be Revolutionary War landforms. And it's on top of a hill. Now, that's one thing that all these forts had in common. They were on top of a hill and they had water sources. So uh, the point is, we can interpret what happened at Fort Third Thickety the way it has been uh, preserved to this point and this is a wreath laying ceremony that the uh, sons of the revolutionary gave back in in july uh, we don't need that uh, so fort lindley in lawrence county across this field right here there's three different accounts of the battle one battle says 190 uh, Cherokees and Tories dressed as Cherokees attacked across that field. Another account says 245. Another account says 600. The fort sits inside this tree line here. Fort Lindley was named after James Lindley. I mentioned that James Lindley was at the Battle of the Cane Break. He was captured at the Battle of the Cane Break uh, during the Snow Campaign. I mentioned that David Fanning was a 19-year-old sergeant at the Battle of the Cane Break. At the attack on Fort Lindley, uh, David Fanning is now a 19-year-old captain. I'm sure probably most of y'all here know about David Fanning. Um, he lived 10 miles from where this fort is. James Lindley owned the property where this fort was. It was named after him, but, but uh, James Lindley was a loyalist. He was a, uh, a justice of the peace in uh, the 96th district. He was given this land with this fort on it. But he was uh, driven off in the snow campaign in the backcountry in 1775. So uh, this is the Battle of Fort Lindley 
happened as part of the Second Cherokee War or the Cherokee War of 1776.